In Joseph Anderson's video on Hollow Knight, he begins by providing his basic distinction between a review and a critique. For him, a review is a determination of value in relation to price. A critique is an evaluation of the material, its strengths and weaknesses, as art, divorced from the correlation to price. I think that for video essayists, this is generally a good rule of thumb, but for the purpose of Disco Elysium, I feel like a third category must be introduced. Analysis. Analysis is a step above critique. It takes the successes and failures, strengths and weaknesses, and evaluates them on a thematic, ideological, literary, or formal dimension, their purpose, and what the game is attempting to say. Disco Elysium is a dense and complicated game. It is a game that can be reviewed based on its price and value, and critique based on its successes and failures compared to the genre as a whole. In fact, the first third of this video will operate primarily as a critique. But for a game like Disco Elysium, it is only through analysis that we can really sink our teeth into what makes this game so good. You may have noticed that my previous video on Metro Last Light used some basic principles of Lacanian psychoanalysis. I intend to subject Disco Elysium to an even stricter form of that analysis, because this is one of the games that I think legitimately warrants an analysis of the form and content of the experience. Every game can be analyzed, but very few rarely are. Even when the moniker of analysis is used, the actual analytic portion feels closer to a critique. With Disco Elysium, we'll be tackling a review, a critique, and an analysis, each one gradually building on one another. Now why do I think it's necessary to even begin with this? Because I want to let you know what you're in for. If you're here for review, then here it is. Disco Elysium is one of the best games that I've played in years, and I felt like it justified the price. I've spent more money on games that have the depth of a wet fart. Disco Elysium is not one of those games. So as a basic spoiler-free review, this game is incredible and you should play it. But the reason I'm making this video more than any other reason is because of Planescape Torment. Planescape Torment was, and is, a game that has been talked about for years. It's often said to be one of the best written games of all time because of its density, depth, and sharpness of thought. I think that everything said about the brilliance of, of Planescape Torment is true. It's a game that has continued to be a topic of conversation and debate for years. Disco Elysium saw a great deal of discussion around the time of its release, and it received heaps of praise, but it feels as if the conversation has been limited to, it's the game that lets you play a communist. While the surface level conversation around the game is still alive and well, I feel as if the critical conversation never saw a major push. People still talk about Planescape because there's years worth of discussion and debate around the content. It is a game that is ripe for analysis. I think Disco asks just as many relevant questions and has just as many scenarios that are worthy of discussion that are just sitting there waiting to be pulled apart and thought about. So this video is a survey of Disco Elysium as a philosophical and political work of art, and an analysis of some of the pieces that we dissect. I in no way consider this to be a definitive statement on the game, but rather I hope to spark a more intricate and nuanced conversation around this game that I think deserves it. In broad strokes then, what is the position I will be taking towards Disco Elysium? The base idea would be the distinction between Disco Elysium's morality system and other games of this ilk. I think nothing marks the uniqueness of Disco Elysium's morality system more plainly than by just simply viewing it at face value. Disco of Elysium has four ideologies, liberalism, fascism, moralism, and communism. These ideologies correspond to actual ideological apparatuses that exist in our world. While this game looks favorably upon one of these ideologies more than others, it still lays out healthy critiques of all of the chosen ideological systems, and in its fidelity to ideological critique, identifies points of irreducible tension in each of these systems. These tensions are points of contradiction that the system must exclude and orient around in order to appear coherent. Communism is the system which the developers lean most favorably towards, but they still hold that communism itself is not free of ideological trappings. They see the necessity of the principles of communism, and the world of Disco Elysium sees the necessity of communism. But before anything can be done, they must first understand why the commune in Recheval failed. It's like a playable version of Zizek's reversal of Marx's thesis 11. Okay, Marx's formula was, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. 
The Zizekian reversal is, we tried to change the world too quickly, and it failed. The time is now to think. This lends nicely with the mechanical reality of Disco Elysium. You only talk and think, you don't act. There is no action, per se, in the game. And I think that's a testament to the game's rigorous belief in the power of conceptualization and thought. Ultimately, Disco Elysium is making a political statement, a statement for the revival of the left after the fall of communism. While this may seem apparent for many, we need to understand the philosophical basis for this new conceptualization of a left-wing movement and how Disco conceives of this. So, with all of that said, today we'll be conducting an in-depth analysis of Disco Elysium, the CRPG released by ZAUM. This video, as you may have noticed from the length, has gotten quite out of hand and is very long. There are plenty of excellent gameplay critiques and story recaps already available on YouTube, and while this video will be providing a recap of the plot, I will not be focusing heavily on the actual gameplay of Disco Elysium, especially since the gameplay is moving around and talking. In this video, I'll be doing one of those things. In the description box down below, you will find the sections of this video broken into chapters to allow for easier navigation. This video is primarily broken down into four parts. The first part, a brief layout of the RPG landscape as well as a basic theory about the breakdown of certain RPGs. After this, we will be getting into the game itself. This section mostly focuses on the murder mystery main quest of the game, but I will make arguments throughout that will pave the way for the third section, which is a critique of Disco Elysium using a variety of lenses that you may have seen implemented in my previous video on Metro Last Light. The main theorists I will be using in this video include Jacques Lacan, Slavoj Žižek, Hegel, and Alenka Zupanchik. And finally, we will conduct a brief analysis of the title of the game as well as the opening epigraph and poem. The text that I'm using for this video will be listed down below. Also, before I continue any further, this video will be primarily using gameplay from Disco Elysium and, when relevant, will be matching up the actual essay with the on-screen video content. But Disco Elysium and other CRPGs we will be discussing are text-heavy games, so I implore those of you watching to treat this video more like a podcast with visuals as opposed to a fully-fledged video. On a final note, this video will contain numerous spoilers for Disco Elysium. If you are okay with being spoiled, as well as receiving my own analytic perspective on the game, then by all means continue watching. But if you would like to go through the story on your own and come to your own conclusions about the game, I would recommend turning this video off and coming back to it later. Moral Complexity and Player Choice for some, this is the overriding staple of the RPG genre, and more specifically the faux tabletop CRPG variants. The role-playing game has always prided itself on this semblance of choice. From the earliest days of Baldur's Gate and Wasteland, with its simple, charming, and engaging dialogue options, towards the absolute behemoth of Planescape Torment, into the equally impressive yet morally and philosophically more simplistic endeavors of Mass Effect and The Witcher. But has the RPG genre still prided itself on this need for player choice? Is the RPG this narrative apparatus for complex and engaging storytelling for players, or is it a mechanical ludathon? Or is it both of these things? Or is it none of these things? Another question that the role-playing game thrusts upon us almost subliminally regards notions of free will and choice. Are we really free when playing a video game? Do we really have free will? If we look to the first Bioshock, the answer is a resounding no. The game argues that we are unthinking toys, silently and unquestionably following the orders laid out before us. Many players believe that free will is the ability to make a choice in the moment. But I'll argue later on that free will and the freedom to choose only come about retroactively, only after the deed itself is done. Now that sounds a bit abstract, but to give a little teaser, the reason that I have this position comes from Slavoj Žižek's view on the dialectic. The dialectic is a logical tool which aids in the discovery of contradiction as the driving force of thought and being, and that identity involves what negates it. I'll link to a text down below that is a good primer to dialectical thinking. These are two definitions of the dialectic that I hope to continually reinforce to show that Disco Elysium confronts dialectical materialism in a unique way. Now, this has massive implications for philosophy, political theory, and ideology, but I'm mainly interested, for the purpose of this argument, on Zizek's view on the dialectic of history. 
specifically that the future is open, and that one can only ever look backwards in history to determine the conditions of possibility for a given event or choice. As he says, quote, only when the thing takes place can we see how it was possible, end quote. So to lay it simply, and this applies both to playing games with choice systems and our own lives, we are predetermined, but we are fully responsible for how we are determined. This is where retroactivity comes into play. We only understand and determine our predestined choice after the event itself. Again, while this may seem abstract now, I hope to explore these concepts in greater depth in the later sections of this video. Now, the RPG, the role-playing game, is a genre that has lost its stabilized meaning beneath the endless expanse of damage numbers and loot drops. And that isn't inherently bad. In fact, some of the most fun I've had playing video games has been from seeking the new weapon or piece of armor that will give me just that edge in a combat encounter. This is the mythos of Skyrim and Diablo and Borderlands and the Bethesda Fallout series. Again, nothing there is implicitly or explicitly bad, but it rather misunderstands, I believe, the very axiom of what it means to be a role-playing game. I love hardcore role-playing games, games that attach you to an identity, something or someone initially fluid and moldable that becomes more concrete as you learn and live through this framework that you've designed to engage with the world. But there is an obvious question that gets overlooked about the RPG genre. The question itself is comically simple. What is a role-playing game? The fluidity of that name and title is what allows for the very core of the genre to essentially have been lost over time. A role-playing game is a deliberate endeavor. It can and most likely should have stat checks and specific character builds and point distributions. These are mechanical flavorings to solidify the principle that you are playing a role, a role that can and should be unique upon subsequent playthroughs. When I play a properly genre-specified RPG, I perform a simple test to determine its RPG-ness. Can I play a role? Can that role be altered substantially upon subsequent playthroughs? Are those subsequent playthroughs still rewarding insofar as they can alter the trajectory and relationship of your character with themselves, their party, and the greater world around them? Is narrative prioritized or on par with gameplay? And finally, are certain pieces of content only available for specific roles or character builds? It's an absurd test. It's a simple test. And it's an overtly puritanical test. When I consider the criteria that I laid out, I think it's also important to understand that, for my sensibilities, an RPG is a narrative triumphing over mechanical gameplay, or both being on par with one another in terms of relevance to the actual game. But for the criteria laid out above, specifically my last point, the specific pieces of content, such as branching story choices, must carry narrative ramifications, not simply mechanical ramifications. Again, this is overtly puritanical, but deliberately so. The RPG is a genre that has become so quickly overwrought, overrun, and vampirically distilled into an essence that is fundamentally antithetical to the nature of what these types of games can be. I think we can begin to breach the intricacies of what it means to be an RPG by simply naming a few. Disco Elysium, Borderlands 3, and Skyrim. What are the mechanical and narrative commonalities which link these games together? What is it that makes one more of an RPG than another? If we match up these three games and compare them to my list of criteria above, we begin to see the rough contours of two distinct attitudes towards the role-playing genre the completionist approach, and the particularist approach. The Bethesda attitude towards role-playing games absolutely exudes this completionist attitude in a way that is almost comically bereft of creativity. In Skyrim, I can be the Archmage, the Dovahkiin, the head of the Dark Brotherhood, and more, without any significant overlapping or conflicting operandi. Now, this is not a new critique. 
It's one that has been hammered and nailed so often and with such a tenacity and vigor that as a surface level critique, it has lost any impact. But there's a different tact that we can take to this attitude. Your character, your role, is a non-existent void of pure activity, unable through the very logic of the game to define the contours of your unique identity. Identity, as I have found through my own lived experience, is not something that is automatically intrinsic to you, but that is in part cultivated through your interaction with the world and with what you're not. The two are linked and interface with one another. Your identity emerges in the moments after you choose. When you do some action at the expense of something else and have to rationalize what made that choice possible and why you did what you did. These are some of the most startling and revelatory moments about who we are as people. And yet the completionist game, in its anxious and frenetic desire to allow you to do everything with a single character and in a single playthrough, makes your character nothing. They are a black hole of identity, simply swallowing activities without any consideration as to how they impact your character on a moral, emotional, or ethical level. This type of role-playing opens up incredible opportunities for player choice and to develop an attachment with the world and the gameplay mechanics, as opposed to their specifically designed character. It can always appreciate this type of role-playing game, but it often lacks the hardline choice and skill systems of the original Fallout, Baldur's Gate, and Planescape Torment. The particularist games are severely limiting, but with a necessary point. These games often lack the versatility and openness of broader RPGs, as they prioritize the defining of your character and multiple playthroughs. What these games severely limit is your access to new stories, as you define your character and how they fit into the game world at large. Disco Elysium is an excellent example of precisely this particularist game design philosophy. It is a philosophy which demands players to prioritize certain skills and builds over others, to produce a certain character who interacts with the world in a certain way, effectively negating the min-maxing that so pervades other RPGs. These games ask you to nail down whether you are a fighter or a talker, or some mixture of both. Where do you fall ideologically, and through what specific lens do you navigate the world? No particular style or playthrough is more privileged than another, but depending on what you choose, the game will react and mold itself around these subjective positions. Baldur's Gate, Knights of the Old Republic, and the Neverwinter Nights games allow you to design your build around your specific combat style and class, and where you align on the Dungeons & Dragons or Star Wars morality system. Are you lawful good, neutral evil, light and dark, and so on? Many RPGs incorporate some variant of a sliding morality system, from Mass Effect's Renegade and Paragon options to the Knights of the Old Republic games, allowing you to flow between the light and dark side. What is so striking about Disco Elysium is that it strips down the particularist approach to role-playing game design down to its most bare-bones and fundamental level, and is able to grapple with a universal conception of subjectivity and some core concepts of modern philosophy. Combat in the game is non-existent. You will engage in no magical combat arenas. You will not wield extravagant spells. You are not the chosen one. Instead, Disco Elysium, much like Planescape, allows you to navigate an environment that is meant to provoke moral, philosophical, political, and ethical questions. For me, in a much more visceral way than reading a book or watching a film, the game allowed me to lay bare my own political and philosophical beliefs, although in a much more hamstring than at certain times unnuanced fashion. But even within that constricted domain, it makes a great deal of fascinating claims which relate directly to concepts such as philosophy, Marxism, psychoanalysis, fantasy, and the structure of ideology. Even still, it discusses addiction, the lure of ideological trappings, political centrism, and the relationship between the police and capital. Disco Elysium can be played like a joke, or a hard-boiled detective mystery, or a mixture of both, or ultimately nothing of the sort. Already now, you might notice that my thoughts are rambling, and that any coherence is slowly drifting away, and that's precisely because Disco Elysium is such a difficult game to pin down. It was a game that made me laugh and cry, a game that made me write down a clever joke or witticism, or bust out my copy of Slavoj Žižek's Less Than Nothing and Bruce Fink's The Lacanian Subject. 
I've never played a game that has positioned me all across the map as far as my feelings and frustrations. While I often provoke myself to ask why a story is being told through the medium of video games, I've never played a game that critically asked me, why is this a game? You may have noticed from my previous two videos that this is a question that I tend to ask myself. Why is this a game? What is it about the content of this narrative and the form of video games that makes this project relevant to the medium? And what are the philosophical implications of this game, this medium, this art form? Disco Elysium provides us with a variety of different pathways for critique and analysis and opportunities to tackle these aforementioned questions. But for all of this to work and not appear some rambling, incoherent mess, I think we should start where any good story starts. The beginning. Before you even get into the game, you are dropped into a character skill sheet. There are three pre-made builds and a create your own option. For my playthrough, I went to the create your own skill sheet option and allocated four points into intellect and psyche, and two points into physique and motorics. It was difficult to get a sense of what each of these skills meant, but I decided to allocate the majority of my points into intellect and psyche because I was familiar with the game as being text and dialogue heavy. I also selected rhetoric as my signature skill set, as I felt that it might be helpful to be good at arguing. Also, the playthrough that I had completed for this critique was not technically my first playthrough. I actually played the game at around the time it came out in 2019, and had a uh, less than stellar endeavor. I died in the opening moments after trying to grab my tie from the ceiling, and my character overexerted himself. It was clever and cute and made me laugh, but for one reason or another, I did not start a new game. That was a massive mistake. After the character select screen, you are dropped into a black screen. A conversation begins with your ancient reptilian brain and your limbic system. It was at this moment that I knew I was in for a weird experience. Now let's take apart some of what is going on in this sequence, because I think it will immediately make clear two points. One, this is a detective murder mystery game, but the actual mystery isn't really the murder. And two, you are a detective insofar as you grapple with the bigger questions of subjectivity, desire, ideology, fantasy, and the unconscious. And speaking of that last point, that is precisely where you are at the beginning of this game. Now, just to clarify that last point that I just made, you are not in the unconscious, because that would make it a subconscious, something that you can access, but rather, you're in the zone of repression. The unconscious is simply that which cannot be incorporated into conscious thought, but just because it cannot be directly incorporated into consciousness does not mean that it does not have any power over thought. In fact, the repressed thoughts of the unconscious carry an overbearing structural power over conscious will. This repression makes itself known with a question that you can ask about your X something. Immediately, we know that this is a sensitive topic, something that we cannot adequately broach. Our ancient reptilian brain tells us to stay waiting in the primordial darkness, to not emerge into the world, because the emergence into the world is an emergence into lack. Lack, as a concept, receives a great deal of theorization with the works of Jacques Lacan. Lacan was a psychoanalyst who is probably most famously known for his introduction of structuralist linguistics into Freudian psychoanalysis. Lacan really pushes a lot of concepts that I'll be using throughout my videos, so I'll be linking to some primer material down below if you're interested in reading more about him and his thought. But you don't need to have any intimate familiarity with Lacan at all to work through this video. Hopefully I'll be providing enough information for you to work through some of these concepts that we're going to be exploring here. In Lacanian works, lack is fundamental to our subjectivity, to our being. We are known as lacking subjects. This lack emerges once we are pulled from the presumed wholeness of the mother's womb, the womb here being synonymous for the primordial darkness. We believe in this perceived wholeness, but also feel like we're missing something, and as such are always striving to fill this lack. But this lack is unfillable. You must reckon with that. Nothing makes this point clearer than in a small section where you check yourself in the mirror, you're afraid to wipe the steam that fogs the glass. Your reptilian brain tells you, quite pointedly, that you can never unsee what you see here. What he means by that, in our psychoanalytic reading, is that you can never unsee the presumption of wholeness, 
Although on a physical level we are whole beings, we are actually disparate, non-essential beings found and made out there in the world. This entire opening sequence is an emergence into subjectivity. It's also a greater setup that you are an amnesiac who has drunk himself into a stupor, a stupor so wild and intense that you have literally forgotten all conscious elements of your being. You know from the few pieces of conversations that you've overheard or through the sneers and mockery of guests and attendants at the hotel, the whirling and rags, that you are a police officer. You are a drunk. You are rude. You are hated by one and all in the establishment. You have threatened to kill yourself, and you come to understand that prior to this blackout, you absolutely hated yourself. At one point, amidst a crowd of packed karaoke fans, you threatened to blow your brains out and paint the walls in your blood. It's dark. But you can play this a few ways. Does that sound like you? Does it not? That's simply for you to decide, but you understand that whatever you are now, you've done something truly awful to yourself to reach this state. To call back to the point I made earlier on free will, it's important for us to understand that these events have already occurred. They are predetermined. But it is only after the event itself that we can determine the conditions which led to the event. We choose how they are determined. After this sequence, you meet your partner, Lieutenant Kitsuragi. He is from a different precinct, so there's no intimate familiarity or connection between the two of you. He does not know you, so it gives you an opportunity to totally recontextualize yourself. And just like any good detective story, Kim is your Watson, your sidekick. He serves a twofold purpose. To provide some opposition to your own detective style, or by providing a style of mimicry, and also to serve as your symbolic guide through the world. In fact, it is Kim's motor carriage which cuts through the primordial slumber and formally ingratiates you into the world of Disco Elysium. You can actually hear his car in the darkness. You meet weird and quirky characters and have some particularly memorable interactions, especially one early on with Klasia, which you can totally butcher. It's one of the first really funny moments in the game, and it sets the tone that Disco Elysium is always balancing, between its wry, sometimes meme sense of humor, and its darker, more philosophical musings. I think it balances this incredibly well, which is such a testament to the writing. You're informed of a murder, the man has been killed, the union workers are the prime suspects. Tensions are bubbling in Reshevol between the Dock Workers Union and Wild Pines, a multinational conglomerate. The union has gone on strike, and industry in Reshevol has come to a standstill. A group of scabs have organized to dissolve the strike, while the union has hired racists to block anyone from tampering with the gates to open up the work facility. You know that the world is well and truly fucked. Throughout your time meandering through the city, bumping from one conversation to another, there is a palpable and eerie stillness as if the world has stopped, come to a standstill completely. This is a feeling that we'll discuss later on, but it's one that is absolutely crucial to the thematic and narrative consequences of Disco Elysium. Specifically, that in the ruins of the failed post-revolutionary Reshevol, it is as if time has stopped. The capital follows. But so do the drugs and the alienation and the debilitating sadness. The Union, as horrifically corrupt and awful as it is, provides a beacon of solidarity for many workers and citizens of Reshevol. But it seeks change and power only through the fetters of capitalism. The Union is quite blatantly not a source of any revolutionary potential in the world of Disco Elysium. They placate the halls of power, and seek that power for themselves, but do not seek to radically restructure the organization of society and the distribution of that power. In effect, the Union relies upon the reigning supremacy of capitalist ideology, and only functions in and through that domain. It was actually a really incredible moment when I first went and spoke to Everett Clare, because quite honestly he said all of the right things. 
He spoke of a workers' controlled business, where the workers have a democratic say in the conditions of their environment. He spoke of social programs to benefit the local youth. He spoke of the revitalization of industry in Rescheval. But if you consider what Claire says outside of the democratic control of the workplace, he actually insists on a resubstantialization and revitalization of capitalist hegemony and markets into Rescheval. On a related note, Slavoj Žižek speaks of the advent and industriousness of global capitalism in China, specifically how the Communist Party in China is actually one of the most precise, exacting, and ruthless capitalists on the global market. In effect, the former communists and the socialists are the most effective capitalists. Listening to Everett Clare, this continually rung true. Now, we can read Everett Clare as either genuine or disingenuous, as a socialist or sympathizer, but no matter his leaning or affiliation, he still operates as a fully functioning, or even more exacting, agent of capital, more so than Joyce Massier. Clare is a brutal capitalist with inklings of social democratic positions because it is what he needed to survive. While he believes himself in our genuine reading to be acting as a destabilizing force within capitalism, he simply operates as another element of the mode of production. We don't need to go very far to locate the contradictions in Claire's position. He is the union boss, advocating for the freedom of the working man, but he plans to use this power and influence to bulldoze an entire seaside community to pave the way for a massive shopping complex. It is brutal and cold and inhumane, but Claire is able to justify this position as the only possible pathway to revitalize industry and prepare for some socialist uprising. An uprising that will never come. Joyce Messier, on the other hand, is a kind-hearted liberal. She is actually genuinely nice and helpful. But it's not because she is simply nice and helpful, but because her position in the capitalist ladder of power affords her the opportunity to be of a learned spirit. After I finished the game, I did some research on subreddits and forums to determine how her character was regarded by players. It seemed like, out of the explicitly political cast of characters, she seemed to be the one that people gravitated to the most. But I think the very fact that she is the most trusting character goes to show how shades and forms of liberalism can say the right things, even, you know, that she was a former communist herself, but that on the level of action and praxis, there is a counterintuitive measure of succumbing to capital. Words and actions are at a deadlock, but between the two, actions are always more telling. This is something that the film Parasite explores quite precisely, that the poor family is brutal and conniving and calculating because in order to survive under oppressive capitalist hegemony, this attitude is required so that they can survive and thrive. The rich family can be nice and decent because they have been placed in a specific position in the social and material hierarchy that allows them to do so. Again, what we're encountering here is varying shades and degrees of ideology, some more sympathetic than others, but they each circle around some hard philosophical bedrock that lays the foundations for that ideological system. With liberalism, we have the belief that humans are rationally motivated and self-interested actors. Under some communist and or revolutionary political ideology, we have the belief that humans are communal beings striving to fulfill an intrinsic human desire for work and purpose. It is economically organized around communal distribution, mutual aid networks, and a dissolved state. On a thematic level, and I think one that connects directly with the leftist political affiliation of the studio and some of the voice actors who worked on the game, Disco Elysium finds itself espousing the vestiges of some new political philosophy arising from the literal ruins and ashes of the destroyed communist revolution in Rescheval. One of the powerful things about Disco Elysium is that we have the advent of some new philosophical bedrock, one that begins here with Harry Dubois. After Harry and Kim conduct a thorough analysis of the corpse, the two determine that the man was in fact hanged by a group of eight people but that he also has a bullet wound. So he's been shot and hanged, and the shooting came first. This means that the hanged man was already dead by the time of the hanging. You meet with the militant wing of the Union, Titus Hardy and his crew, and they immediately reveal that they were the ones that hanged the man outside. They say that he raped Klausia. If you have a high enough skill check, you can see through this lie that he's weaving for you. You soon learn that the hanged man was with Klausia at the time of his death. He was shot and killed. The leading suspect at this halfway point of the game becomes Ruby. 
Ruby is one of the heads of the Union organization, and as we're told by Clausia, is the one who concocted the hanging plan. But after the hanging, she mysteriously disappears. There is also this unaccounted block of time, about 15 minutes, when Ruby could have shot the man. She becomes the prime suspect. After some time, you find Ruby, and she informs you that she did not shoot the man, and that the plan to hang the man was actually Clausia's, and that Ruby had feelings for Clausia. You can immediately jump on this as a possible motive, but now there are so many conflicting pieces of information that it's difficult to choose who to believe. Ruby, at this point, depending on how you handle this situation, can either escape or kill herself. There may be another option, but these are the two options that occurred during my playthroughs of the game. Either way, in both of these circumstances, you return to the Whirling and find that a standoff is currently underway between the Union Man and the leader of the Scabs. It turns out that he wasn't just a Scab after all, but a hired private military contractor sent in with the Hanged Man to dissolve and disband the Strike. It also turns out that the Scab leader was the Hanged Man's foster brother. He and his goons threaten to kill everyone at an unauthorized tribunal. You step in and attempt to quell tensions, but it seems, and I could be wrong on this, but it happened on each of my playthroughs, that it always ends in a bloodbath. No matter how much you plead and beg and reason, there is no quelling the fire of a burning heart and a boozed mind. Gunshots ring out, bullets whiz across the courtyard, and bodies begin to fall. Titus and the rest of the crew are murdered. No matter how often you try to reasonably explain the inconsistencies in the Union story, no matter how many contradictions you identify, the ideological position of the private military personnel will most often lead them down the road of bloodshed. During this altercation, Harry is shot, and depending on certain decisions, Kim may also be shot, although this never happened on either of my playthroughs. You also discovered that Klasia has left a vital clue pointing to the true location of the shooter. It is on an island just off the coast of Reshaval. You commandeer a boat and travel there. As you approach the island, there is an unspoken understanding that the true identity of the shooter will soon be revealed. When I first got to this section of the game, watching as the waves lapped against the hull of our small dinghy, my mind raced with the possibilities. Was it another member of the paramilitary group? Was it actually a union member? There's also this seemingly important information that Klausia was a corporate spy whose last job went horrifically wrong. Is it possible that this was a hit against Klausia that failed? Although all of these possibilities are perfectly reasonable, the true reveal is that an old communist from the Reshevillian commune killed the hanged man because he could, because he had feelings for Klausia, and because he wanted to kill a fascist. Although he never admits it, it is possible he committed these deeds for all of these reasons, or none of these reasons. The truth of the situation is impossible to pin down, and that's exactly my point. The impossibility, the contradictory nature of attempting to pin down exactly why this murder happened is not something that can be clearly explained. After you conclude the conversation with the deserter, a cryptid, the Insulindian Phasmid, a creature thought not to exist to be a purely fictitious impossibility, exposes itself. This is a creature that, as a side quest for Lena, you will try to hunt down for her husband. In a properly Hegelian way, in this moment, the impossible becomes possible. And as we get some really incredible information that when retroactively considering the entirety of the game, completely recontextualizes the entire experience. After this encounter with the Phasmid and the case is practically solved, Harry and Kim return to the mainland where Harry's partners from his precinct, who have been following him all game, are waiting. They have been evaluating you, determining if you're fit to return back to work and to properly bridge the character that you have played, this Harry, and the old Harry. After this conversation, the credits roll. Now that is, in big, broad strokes, Disco Elysium. But this story that I just gave you is just the main narrative thread. It completely misses all of the subtext that makes this game a truly incredible experience and one of the best gaming experiences I've ever had. I felt it was necessary to paint this picture so that you can get some more concrete details on the game. The main reason that I think we needed to have the main narrative laid out before us is so that we can evaluate that the murder mystery is not actually the point of the narrative. Although it is the motor for playing, the actual thematic 
political and philosophical ramifications of Disco Elysium emerge from the small side quest material that lays the foundation for a unique philosophical bedrock. So to examine this, we're going to discuss dialectics and the absolute. We're going to then select an ideology that I think is most representative of the development studio, my own personal beliefs, and the beliefs of some of the people who worked on the project, and we're going to try and figure out what Disco Elysium has to say and how it critiques this ideology. We're then going to see how this game offers an alternative path and itself concludes with the overcoming of one contradiction into the realm of a deeper, more intractable, more politically fruitful contradiction. Now that we know the full story, but before we delve into specific moments in the game, I think it's necessary for us to understand a concept from Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek known as the absolute recoil. I will link to an article from Christian Fuchs down below, but he provides a very concise definition of what we're looking for. The absolute recoil is, quote, the speculative coincidence of opposites in the movement by which a thing emerges out of its own loss, end quote. While this concept and what I've just said may seem very abstract, I hope to qualify it. But to understand any of this, we must understand the concept of loss. Harry's fundamental structuring loss, as the game very clearly tells us, is his relationship to his ex-wife. But it is a trauma that is so traumatic that to directly confront it would essentially end Harry. So in order to confront this absolute trauma, he must absolutely recoil. He must drown himself in booze and make his nose raw with drugs. He must create a fantasy to approach the trauma. The dialectical movement of the absolute recoil and of Harry is as follows. There is the starting point, known as the positing reflection, which is the Harry that we only gleam from tidbits of information and conversation. This is the Harry before the blackout, the Harry that we do not know. We're only able to identify the contours of some previous Harry, and there's a lot of conflicting information that we receive about this version of Harry, from his death wish to his love of disco. But in the dialectical movement, this starting point becomes negated so that, I quote, the original situation is lost, and the origin is experienced as inaccessible." End quote. In the primordial darkness, Harry is experiencing the cut of subjectivity. He's only able to emerge as a subject retroactively, after the horrific pain and torture of his existence and the trauma of the end of his relationship. But with our blacking out, all of that information is lost to us. We only receive small flickers of what once was. The origin is inaccessible. The final movement is that the new situation, otherwise known as the Harry that we actively play, quote, is transposed back into the origin itself, end quote. While the game is a detective murder mystery, it operates much more profoundly as a dialectic of subjectivity. The true mystery is uncovering the intractability of contradiction. Let's use some of these concepts that I've just mentioned to create a little formula or anecdote that makes these points clearer. I'm going to use two examples that come from the Slavoj Žižek subreddit, both from user and non-author, but that I'm going to be retrofitting for the purposes of Disco Elysium. The links to these comments will be listed down below in the description box. So what is the original story? Some blind men are walking one day and they encounter an elephant on their path. They don't know what this thing is, so each blind man gets to work trying to figure it out. One blind man touches the leg and says, this is a trunk. Another one touches the tail and says, it's a rope. And the last one touches the tusk and says, this is a pipe. Each of the blind men are engaging in the positing reflection. They are each individually engaging with the same thing, but positing different reflections. So the blind men get together and compare what they found. Turns out that they cannot agree on what the thing is. They have a variety of different accounts. Between them, there is an idea of the thing in itself. The next obvious thing would be for them to put all of their accounts together and discover that all of their different accounts point towards the thing in itself being an elephant. But for Zizek, that would be incorrect. Let's say that another man is walking down the road and he spots these blind men arguing and discussing their conflicting accounts. This man can see and he tells the blind men, Hey, that's an elephant. The Zizekian point would be that this man, who can see this is in fact an elephant, isn't really in a different position from the blind men because we still don't know what the elephant is in itself. Because there are so many ways to interpret the elephant. 
We could talk about this elephant from a chemical perspective. You know, it has this chemical makeup and biological properties. We could talk about the elephant from a literary or symbolic perspective, how the elephant appears in literature, or as in how people who collect elephants face the trunks towards the door in an almost mystical way. The important thing is that between all of these perspectives, there is an idea of the thing in itself, the elephant. None of these single perspectives gather everything into one frame. There is always the elephant in itself that all of these perspectives proceed from. The final Zizekian Hegelian move is to say that there is no elephant in itself. Basically, the elephant is not some substantial positive in itself that we can never grasp and comprehend, but is instead the inconsistencies and contradictions of all of these varying perspectives. To put it another way, the elephant, the thing in itself, does not have a positive existence that allows you to go, ah, this is an elephant. But rather, the elephant is the failure of that statement to encompass the totality of the elephant. The thing in itself is not some supernatural thing that exists in another world, but is instead a contradiction that generates inconsistencies. So the thing has not proceeded from another, from some other place, some kingdom of God, for example, but its essence is only its failure to define its essence. Okay, so we did some heavy lifting philosophy work there, but now we approach the question, what the absolute ever living fuck does any of this have to do with Disco Elysium? Well, everything that I just mentioned is in part a commentary on the nature of Hegelian ph philosophical reasoning but it is also the structure of a typical detective story. Any good detective story focuses on the use and nature of contradictions to explore the truth of a given crime. So in this way, Hegelian philosophy and the detective story are intertwined. Now let's use an example to explain this. When you're watching Columbo, before you spend any time with the detective himself, you watch the crime happen. You know who did it and you watch them try to set up the perfect crime. The show is structured around the reversal of the whodunit formula. In a normally structured detective story, you only see the aftermath of the crime. In a Columbo story, you see the event, the perpetrator. All the criteria for the initial whodunit is answered in the first 10 to 15 minutes. We, as viewers, think that we have the whole case figured out, and we're just waiting for Columbo to catch up with us. But in fact, what the opening 15 minutes of Columbo shows us is that even this perfect crime that the criminal is trying to create is full of cracks and inconsistencies. The goal of a good detective is to locate these cracks and contradictions in crime scenes and stories because they are evidence of the thing itself, the crime. It is only after the crime that we can begin to identify contradictions, which is what allows us to posit the thing itself. In Disco Elysium, you do a lot of that work. You look for contradictions and cracks in stories to help piece together the thing itself, the crime of who killed the hanged man. But you also do the same work on a philosophical level to work through one of the game's most fascinating side quests, questioning the nature of reality and subjectivity. The game in this way is able to critique ideology, maintain a thrilling murder mystery, and engage in moments of proper Zizekian philosophy. Now I mentioned earlier that the game follows the flow of the proper Zizekian dialectical materialism. What did I mean by this? The function of Hegelian Zizekian dialectics and Marxist dialectics, which the game heavily critiques but is undoubtedly sympathetic towards, are inverted on one another. The standard and almost original Marxist dialectic can be read as follows. The Marxist dialectician would identify a contradictory structure, that being capitalism, and determine where in that mode of production capitalism is sustaining the contradiction. For capitalism, the primary contradictory force is capital itself. Quoting Zizek again, the capitalist's incessant development and revolutionizing of its own material conditions, the mad dance of its unconditional spiral of productivity, is ultimately nothing but a desperate flight forward to escape its own debilitating inherent contradiction. The goal of the Marxist, and I'll be quoting here the introduction to the portable Karl Marx by Eugene Kamenica, is to produce a truly rational society, to produce, quote, a free republic of reason in which contradiction, the mark of abstraction, of separation, of external determination, had completely disappeared." End quote. So the goal of the Marxists is to end contradictions and to end alienation itself. The end of these contradictions, which would coincide with the end of capital, would be the ushering in of communism. 
It is apparent and recognized in Marx's writings as well as Lenin's that contradictions would still continue to persist under the dictatorship of the proletariat, otherwise known as the transitory period between capitalism and communism. Yet the point always remains. The Marxists see this transitory state not as a period towards a deeper contradiction, but away from the contradiction itself. Now, if you remember the story of the blind men and the elephant, we should immediately notice some conflicting information here. The Marxists say that the contradiction is the point of the most abstraction, the point of falsity in a system, the point which, if abolished, would free the system itself. In effect, and this is an absolutely incendiary comment, Marx wanted capitalism without capital. Marx wanted to maintain the productivity associated with capitalism, but remove the exploitative extraction of surplus value. But the Hegelian Zizekian would say that the contradiction is the point of the real. Where Marx sees the contradiction as the inhibitor of the thing itself, Hegel sees the contradiction as the thing itself. The Hegelian Zizekian dialectic can be summed up quite nicely by using the elephant example again, but instead of using the elephant, we can use Harry. Harry has access to 24 skills and a signature skill. But Harry, as your playable character, does not emerge through his successes, but rather through his successive failures. The allocation of the skill points do not fully explore the contours of Harry, but rather, the contradictory nature of these skills and Harry's interaction with the game environment expose the player to the absolute figure of Harry. Throughout the course of the game, and depending on how you play, of course, you will move through various ideologies, dialecticize them, and move to a deeper level of contradiction, from fascism to liberalism to moralism and finally to communism. You will move through each of these ideologies and meet characters who represent each of them until you reach the intractable contradiction of the pale. Simply put, the two dialectics are reversed. Hegel seeks the overcoming of contradictions into deeper contradictions, while Marx seeks the overcoming and eradication of contradiction. But Hegel, Zizek, and Lacan see reality, being, and subjectivity as contradictory, and that the very contradictory nature of these things is what produces reality. So what is the point of the distinction here? Why does it matter that Marx got the critique of political economy right, but didn't get his theory of philosophy down packed? Specifically because it is only through theories of humanity, being, and reality that we can come close to thinking through alternatives to capitalism. But, and this is the great Zizekian political point, that to even get to that level, at least now in our modern age, we needed the failure of Soviet communism to provide a new contradiction to overcome, to get to a deeper contradiction. There's an excellent critique of Planescape Torment by Noah Caldwell Gervais on YouTube. Chances are that if you're watching this video, you've seen it before. If you haven't, I'll be linking to it down below. It's a great piece, but I think it misses what I consider to be the real brilliance of Planescape. It's regarding the famous question, what can change the nature of a man? This question applies to Planescape and Disco Elysium, and both have striking similarities in terms of narrative structure and themes but I think Disco pulls this all together in a much more concise way. Planescape tells you that this is not your first life, the first time you've died, but rather that you've lived and died and run the gambit across the entire spectrum of the Dungeons & Dragons morality system. The choice with the Night Hag matters this time in this playthrough because this is the only time that you've made a truly free choice, even regarding this question. As I've mentioned before, we are predetermined. All of the previous events and choices have happened, but you, not some higher power, determines the conditions of that choice and how you reconcile yourself to it. Planescape shows the disparate and fractured nature of subjectivity, but across multiple forms and lives. You inhabit the same body, but the argument can be made that you are not the same person. But with Disco, the entire contradiction of being and identity occurs in a single life. In this way, it retains a much greater degree of fidelity to the actual subjective experience. We can formulate it like this. The nameless one is not any one of those experiences or lives, but is instead the contradiction between those experiences. It's only when we identify the failure of any one of those lives or experiences to encapsulate the entirety of the subjective experience that we see the contradictory nature of being and identity. The nameless one, like the night hag tells us, is a divided subject. But the division does not come from the curse placed on us, but is instead the imminent feature of identity itself. 
Disco Elysium simply takes this temporal and physical division of the Nameless One and transposes it into the subjective experience of Harry. Harry is a divided subject like we are divided subjects. The function of ideology is to attempt to smooth out those contradictions and make them into clear oppositions and produce figures of authority to maintain those oppositions. Oppositions function in stabilizing identity and also creating clear binary distinctions. The danger of this is clear with fascists. Even with liberals, the almost divine substantialization of market forces, as in the market knows best, completely neglects the inhumane excess of the system itself. Those who are battered by the market system then grow to disdain it, with the liberals thereby fermenting the conditions to create their own oppositional force. With the communists, an ideology centered around the critique and analysis of the impact of systems on people, still manages to personalize atrocities and create a separate oppositional force. Now, it's more nuanced with them, but I laid out that argument earlier. But in effect, Disco Elysium, just like good Hegelian philosophy, shows us that if the nature of life and being and identity are themselves contradictory, how can we not seek that same fidelity in our political organization? Marxism, as I mentioned earlier, seeks the escape from contradiction, which leads to events like the Stalinist terror. This is where a look at Hegelian philosophy is helpful, because Hegelian philosophy is about the movement from one opposition towards a deeper and more intractable contradiction. That is, until we cannot go any further, and we can only conclude that logic, thought, being, and identity arise out of contradiction, and that we may only reconcile ourselves to the contradiction and build from there. Disco Elysium and our own modern age provide some excellent mimicry of one another. We are all living in the fall of communism, just like the people of Reshamal. It would be naive to believe that capitalism had not fully won out. But to conceive of a new leftist project, we must examine where the communist movement failed, and how we can generate a genuinely new leftist project. This reason is why the final reveal of the murderer happens to be an old communist. I saw on Reddit and other forums that people really did not like this ending. They felt like it came out of nowhere and made no sense whatsoever. It also wasn't especially satisfying for some because of how out of the blue and disconnected it was. If we consider the reveal of the communist deserter as only related to the plot through the murder mystery itself, then it feels disjointed. But if you consider this instead as a confrontation with the old, a confrontation with the ideological project of communism, then this entirely recontextualizes the game and the purpose of the project as a whole. The deserter is the most devout communist you meet in the game, and in him espousing his personal moral and ideological beliefs, you are immediately confronted with the aftermath of the communist project. It is necessary for this conversation to occur, to have an ideological battle in the guise of a detective story. But more than that, and I think ultimately pointing to the secondary nature of the murder mystery in comparison to the ideological, philosophical, and political thrust of the narrative, the game does not end after this conversation. In fact, it reaches its true apex. The appearance of the Insulindian Phasmid is a moment of true, unspoken grandeur and mysticism. It is a twig-like creature with thin appendages. It moves gracefully and glides across the water. In your conversation, the Phasmid reveals that the Pale, a substance that resides beyond the boundaries of the Isolas, which covers nearly 70% of the Earth's surface and is dangerous to humanity and slowly enveloping the planet, arrived with human consciousness. Here, again, we have an incredible moment where the very threat and death of humanity only surfaces with humanity itself. Humanity is, itself, an impossibility. Quoting Zizek in the introduction to the sublime object of ideology, quote, Man is an animal sick unto death, an animal extorted by an insatiable parasite reason, logos, language." End quote. The basic lesson of the Insulindian Phasmid is that we exist in a contradictory world where the birth of humanity signals at the same instant its death. The relationship between humanity and the Pale is an insurmountable contradiction. There is no going past it, there is no stopping it. We must simply reconcile ourselves to that contradiction. All political projects must spring from that basic reconciliation. Now, what does a piece of this reconciliation look like? We'll look at it on two dimensions, first for humanity in the game and second for Harry. So let's start with humanity. What is the basic lesson of the Insulindian Phasmid? That what defines humanity is not some essential core, but directly involves what negates it. To understand humanity, you must also account for the pale. Humanity itself is, in this reading, already divided from itself. There is already a basic degree of alienation and division that allows the human subject to emerge at all. In effect, this is an argument for a communal sense of solidarity that 
rather than eradicating the contradiction, views the contradiction itself as the very bedrock of experience and solidarity. There is an already existing solidarity that emerges once you reconcile yourself to the notion that all of humanity is as divided as you, that all of humanity is as sick unto death as you. This fully negates the fascist phrenological argument by devaluing the fascist figure of obsession, be they the Jew or some other figure, and showing that they are already as divided and conflicted as you, not harboring some obscene enjoyment or harboring some key to survival beyond the pale. The fascist project believes that with the eradication of this figure, we will achieve total harmony. But as we have seen, harmony itself is a right-wing political goal. It is only through the quest for harmony that horrific atrocities can be justified. To will for harmony is to unwittingly desire for the destabilization of that very harmony. Now, Harry is moving from an initial contradiction of his relationship to Dolores and to himself to the greater insurmountable contradiction of the Pale, and the end of all life as we know it. This view doesn't negate the very real personal trauma of feeling sadness and loss over a breakup or divorce per se, but Harry's view necessarily relies on a belief that he was once whole, but became broken and divided because of his divorce. The truth is that he was always already divided. The dream sequence after the encounter with the deserter is such a telling scene because it reveals Harry's unhealthy obsession to his ex-wife. His ex-wife was, in the dream, literally substantialized to the figure of a god. He did not see Dolores, the woman he once loved, but he saw Dolores, the goddess. This goes to show how Harry only ever defined himself in relation to a figure that he felt was somehow above and beyond himself. Dolores was an authority figure in his mind that granted him a certain degree of consistency in his existence. She validated him, and that is precisely the point of toxicity in the relationship. Harry himself has fallen into an ideological trap, much like the fascist, in substantializing another. Harry drinks himself into oblivion because he believes that if he simply forgets about her, much like how the fascist believes that if they simply eradicate the problem, then harmony will be restored. But for Harry, it is this moment that he drinks himself into amnesia and constructs a fantasy around the Dolores that he's able to actually approach that trauma and confront it. More pointedly, it is with Dolores leaving and with his attempt to forget that he's able to emerge fully as a subject. Harry emerging as a subject is what allows us, the player, to enter the scene. It is within that gap that Harry and the player are able to emerge. Alenka Zupanchik in her book What is Sex makes the argument that subjects emerge with the removal of a signifier, a missing signifier. The missing signifier is what provides coherence and stability to reality itself, but the key point is that the signifier was always missing. We simply presuppose that it was there to begin with. For Zupanchik, this is what separates the human from the animal. The animal has all signifiers at their disposal, while the human has one signifier less. The missing signifier is what gets filled in with ideology. The missing signifier can be God, or the white race, or man itself. But in all of these ideological systems, they are not truly acknowledging the whole, the place of the missing signifier. They are always trying to fill it in. When you try to fill it in, it immediately creates exclusions, in-groups and out-groups, and the striving for harmony, the striving to fill in the whole, to obtain the missing signifier. The position of this missing signifier is the position of the absolute in Hegelian philosophy. This is the moment of the most intractable contradiction. There is no overcoming the missing signifier. Notice that I characterize this position of the intractable contradiction as a whole. It functions almost as a logical whole in reality itself. It's a point that Slavoj Žižek repeatedly makes, that reality itself is incomplete, almost like a video game that provides the illusion of vastness but limits what you can see and what is rendered. Obviously, no video game wants to make their incompleteness and their limitations evidenced in the game experience. In fact, Disco Elysium pulls this same kind of trickery on its Steam store page by advertising a large open world and over 90 hours of content. The large open world is especially untrue because Elysium's world is smaller than most CRPGs that I've played by a large margin. You can run from one end of the map to another in maybe three to five minutes tops. 
But even with all of this, sleight of hand advertising making the game world seem larger than it actually is, Elysium goes the actual step of making Zizek's point on the incompleteness of reality integral to one of the game's quests. In a church, you find that in a specific spot, a cone of silence has appeared. You and a radio game developer begin to uncover that this space of silence is an incarnation of the Pale. It is nothing. In fact, Harry can go so far as to say in one of the dialogue options that this space is less than less than nothing. While the statement itself is a real conundrum to pick through, because the obvious question arises, how can there be less than less than nothing? In fact, how can there be less than nothing? To answer the question, we actually have to turn back to Slavoj Žižek in his book Less Than Nothing, which I believe the game is directly referencing here. But if Disco Elysium is referencing this work, we should ask why. So to do this, let's compare an example from Zizek's book with an explanation for the whole in reality in Disco Elysium. In Less Than Nothing, Zizek describes the formula of Less Than Nothing as follows. Quote, there is something instead of nothing, not because reality is in excess in comparison with mere nothing, but because reality is less than nothing. This is why reality has to be supplemented by fiction to conceal its emptiness, end quote. This emptiness is precisely the location of the missing signifier, of the position of the absolute. And it is especially telling that the location of this hole in reality is inside of a church. God, or the divine, is typically referred to as the Holy One. If we take that phrasing literally, then it is no coincidence that these holes in logic and reality are conceived of as the positions of God. But to say that this hole in reality is God is precisely the supplementation of fiction that Zizek refers to in the quote. One of the posited theories in Disco Elysium for the existence of the churches is that they were constructed to conceal these holes in reality. Is that not the exact movement of less than nothing? If so, then we should take these references to Zizekian philosophy seriously and explore their various implications. And if we're doing so, then we should understand that one of Zizek's greatest calls in both his philosophical and political writing is to learn from the failure of Soviet communism and to build a new leftist movement that retains its faith to Hegel and Lacan. Zizek always says in his written material and his lectures that the purpose of philosophy is not to provide answers, but rather to ask the right questions. Disco Elysium takes much of this same advice, and I believe that this is why it is so poignant. It does not offer us a new alternative from the failed Marxist or in-game Mazovian communism, but instead it asks us to interrogate these positions and determine where they failed, all the while existing in the ruins of a failed commune. A final point that I would like to make in regards to Disco Elysium not being the, about the murder itself is that the game does not immediately end after the discovery of the murderer or the encounter with the Phasmid. No, the game's final climactic moment is the encounter with your old team. Harry has had his former team following him throughout the course of the game, and this is where the game makes its ultimate point about the nature of free will and the absolute recoil. As I've mentioned previously, as I've mentioned repeatedly, <laughs> The choices that you make are all predetermined, but it's up to you to determine the conditions of that choice. This final climactic moment allows you to work through each of the decisions that you have made throughout the game and orient yourself to that position. It's here that you retain your free choice, not during the game. You retroactively designate your previous choices. It's also here that we have the final movement of the dialectic that we set up earlier in the video. If you'll remember, we discussed three facets of the dialectical process. The positing reflection, the external reflection, and the absolute reflection. The positing reflection are the perceived unrelated and independent parts of Harry that we begin with. In the external reflection, we compare these attitudes and beliefs of the old Harry that is totally lost and inaccessible to us now while we play the game, although we witness his faint echoes to the new Harry that we play. It's only here, at this final moment in the game, the final conversation, that we engage in the absolute reflection. It's here that the new Harry that we play is transposed into that old, inaccessible version of Harry. Here, we finally experience the absolute Harry as the contradictions between these two versions of the character. This is the moment of the absolute recoil, where the gap between the two becomes most evidenced, and we must fully reconcile ourselves to this gap or hole. 
Several comments that I saw online said that this ending is a complete letdown. That it's the moment where the story actually picks up and the murder mystery can reach its full conclusion, but nothing happens. Again, Disco Elysium, and this is the point, was never about that initial mystery. It is about the creation of the new, and the constant struggles of ideology. It's a game about philosophy and subjectivity and the creation of a new leftist political project. It is at this moment that the game reaches the climax of that story. Disco Elysium doesn't give you the answers to much of anything in its world, but it makes you ask the right questions. So now we've reached the final question of this video. What's with the title of the game and with the opening epigraph? They're both striking. When I first saw the title, it caught my attention and it hit me, but I didn't really understand why. And the epigraph also deeply resonated with me, but I, again, didn't understand why. So let's start with the title. Disco is an obvious reference. It represents a thing of the past, something that is no longer with us, but carries a legacy that echoes to this very day. Elysium is, in part, the name of the world in the game, possibly, although, again, this is unconfirmed. In mythological terms, Elysium is essentially a paradise, a place after death for heroes. The conjoining of these two terms creates a sense of temporal unease, a great tension between the past and the future. Disco itself is a relic of the past, and Elysium is a paradise that will never be or that has missed us. We are caught in an impossible tension. There is also a supplementary reading. Harry is a massive fan of disco and reflects on it fondly in conversations. The glamour, the glitz, and the safety and stability and community associated with disco. But disco's gone. Disco is no more. But as I mentioned, we still feel its echoes. Harry still wants disco back, even though disco has moved to Elysium. Disco is dead and buried. Can we not read the position of disco as that of the communist project? that we still feel its echoes but must build something new from its ruins. Communism itself is not immune to dialectics. Is it possible that now is the time for a dialectical analysis of communism itself, to find its impossible tensions and build a new project in its absence? Disco was the sound of the 70s for us and the sound of the 30s for Rushaval. There is no sound now. Nothing that attempts to articulate our communal sense of being and identity. And if we are to believe our discoveries in the highest corners of the church on the outskirts of Rushaval, sound itself is being swallowed. So our time and our ability to articulate some new project is closing rapidly, and every second counts. The title is a call to construct something new. To create the impossible out of the impossible contradiction. So then, what's up with the opening epigraph? The epigraph itself comes from the first lines of Reflections by R.S. Thomas. We should take the title of this poem to be of special importance. We've spent a great deal of time discussing the various stages of reflection involved in the dialectical process. The coincidence of these two usages of reflection, one within the dialectical process and the other in the poem itself, should seem important to us. The game uses the first lines of the poem, but not just that. The game itself was, in its project phase, titled No Truce with the Furies, so we should try to tie this epigraph in with the project as a whole. But I think we should know the whole poem for the purposes of our analysis. Reflections The Furies are at home in the mirror. It is their address. Even the clearest water, if deep enough, can drown. Never think to surprise them, your face approaching ever so friendly is the white flag they ignore. There is no truce with the Furies. A mirror's temperature is always at zero. It is ice in the veins. Its camera is an X-ray. It is a chalice held out to you in silent communion where gaspingly you partake of a shifting identity, never your own. 
The poem is essentially a poetic examination of the blind men and the elephant, the theories here being representative of the conflicting and contradictory nature of identity. The conflict is never at rest and never knows peace. In effect, you can never clearly say what you are. There's a gap between your being and the reflection you see in the mirror. But we can only understand the absent nature of our being through this dialectical process of reflection. That's why identity is always shifting and transforming, because it isn't you doing the shifting and the transformation. You're defined by what you're not, and the Furies and their contradictions, their conflict, is you. This video was long and dense. When I'm breaking down a game, I try to be thorough. I also want to show you that games are subject to rigorous critical analysis. They're an art form. They can't escape the tension between art and profit. That's just kind of the way of things. But Disco Elysium, much like a work from David Lynch, it asks us hard questions, and it makes us uncomfortable, and it makes us think. A game like that warrants special care and attention, and that's what I hope to accomplish in this video. Now. In this video, there's a lot that I didn't get to talk about, like the relationship between the police, ideology, and capital. But that's a video that's been made before for some other really excellent YouTubers, and it's a fruit that is there, ripe for discussion. I wanted to approach this game from its philosophical attitude and fold it outward. I hope you found the video as engaging to watch as it was for me to produce and write. But I guess if you want my own personal takes on the game outside of the analysis, I think it's amazing. As someone who loves rich storytelling and intricately designed worlds, I don't think I've played many games like Disco Elysium. For the purposes of this video, in order to keep it as rounded as possible, and in the realm of RPGs, I actually went back and played Fallout 2 and Planescape Torment to have some type of basic comparison, and I also played Skyrim and Borderlands 3. You know, I wanted this to be a thorough project and a thorough analysis of Disco. The next videos coming up on this channel, most likely in the next month, will be a critique of Fallout 76 Wastelanders, and after that, we will conclude our series on the Metro games. Now, I understand that these more philosophy and psychoanalysis-focused videos appeal to a niche audience. So for the next few videos, these ideas may appear in a far more limited fashion. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to go away, but I'm probably not going to use them as often. Disco Elysium itself may have been lost under the flurry of concepts, ideas, and thinkers, but that was done to emphasize a specific point that I set out to make it at the beginning of the video. Disco Elysium offers us a unique philosophical bedrock in which to spring from. And I hope this video as a whole, more than any singular element within it, is evidence of the almost infinite possibilities that you can venture from in the analysis of this game. The comments on the last few videos were incredibly helpful and constructive, so if you have anything that you'd like to say, please leave them down below because I will be reading them. Also, if there are any questions about the philosophical and psychoanalytic texts that were used in this video, go ahead and leave a comment down below or send me an email. My email can be found in the description box down below. If you have any suggestions for future games or films that I should tackle next, again, as I've mentioned, just leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching.